Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Wei Ming Zi, and today I'm going to be uh, presenting our work on uh, diffeomorphic templates for generalized imitation learning. This is joint work with Tin Lai, Leonel Ott, and Fabio Ramos. So uh, the problem that we're going to be looking at today is this generalized imitation learning problem. So uh, imitation learning is a natural way of teaching robots new skills, essentially by giving them a small number of expert demonstrations and then asking them uh, to learn in a supervised manner. So in this work, we're also interested to see how to imbue additional requirements that are not captured by the data, such as to avoid collision or uh, to follow additional user-specified biases. So a motivating example is shown at the bottom here. So suppose if we you know, teach the robot how to lift a box, we show it these expert demonstrations, and then uh, we throw it in a scenario where there's an additional obstacle. How do we get it to uh, kind of smoothly avoid the obstacle and complete uh, the lifting? So like many other previous work, um, we represent the reproduced motion trajectories here Yeah, so uh, we, we, re we represent the re reproduced motion trajectories as integrals on some asymptotically stable system. So uh, it, it follows uh, kind of, you know, all of these works that do this, and it has been shown that by doing so, uh, you're kind of more uh, robust to perturbations. So a nice way to do this introduced in Rana et al. 2020 was that if, if, if you have uh, a system that you know is um, asymptotically stable, uh, you can use a uh, differentiable and invertible function known as a diffeomorphism to essentially morph this and preserve the uh, stability properties. So the natural question to ask is, apart from learning, can we encode even more behavior into multiple diffeomorphisms, and then essentially just sequentially composing this and aim to morph some known stable system into something that we can use for generalized imitation learning. To this end, we introduce diffeomorphic templates to modularize each of these behaviors. So each diffeomorphic template is a diffeomorphism that introduces, oh, well, that induces a specific behavior such as replicating demonstrations uh, avoiding collisions, and uh, acting on added biases. So what's a nice way to construct these diffeomorphic templates? So a natural way to uh, construct these uh, invertible functions is to view them as integral curves of an initial value problem. Um, so there are some conditions for the existence and the uniqueness of an IVP. Um, and, and what we do here is to get the forward mapping, we essentially take the input and use it as the initial condition and then integrate uh, for a fixed period of time to get the reverse. We'll get the output, use it as uh, the initial conditions, and then integrate reverse in time to get back uh, the initial inputs. Uh, so in this sense, the burden of designing or, or learning this diffeomorphic template actually falls on this vector field, which we call the infinitesimal generator of the diffeomorphic template. So we parameterize this as a weighted combination of fixed uh, Gaussian radius ba radial basis functions. And uh, you know, in, in this way, we satisfy uh, Lipschitz requirements uh, for the existence and uniqueness of the IVP. Uh, but adding on that, uh, we can actually control the smoothness of our trajectories uh, using the hyperparameters of our basis functions. So in the next few slides, I'll, I'll show you how we can learn or craft some of these diffeomorphic templates. So uh, to learn these diffeomorphic templates from demonstrations, we can just formulate a least squares problem between trajectory velocities given, uh, and, and those given by our model, and we can backpropagate the gradients all the way back to the weights of the Gaussian basis functions. And in the middle, uh, the, the green uh, vector field there uh, is, is an example of a learnt uh, infinitesimal generator of a, a diffeomorphic template that morphs uh, the blue vector field into uh, the red. 
We can also craft these diffeomorphic templates from continuous occupancy representations. So uh, continuous occupancy representations find a smooth mapping uh, between coordinates and uh, the probability of those coordinates being occupied. So we can use the occupancy gradients uh, as the infinitesimal generator for our uh, diffeomorphic template. So an example is shown on, on the right there uh, at the bottom. So on, on the left figure, uh, we have a simple attractor and uh, curves on that, and we see um, an obstacle there. Now, by applying this uh, diffeomorphic transform that uh, does obstacle avoidance, we see that we can warp uh, these uh, trajectories uh, smoothly around the obstacle. We can also specify um, biases into the uh, diffeomorphic template. Uh, this is done by directly designing the infinitesimal generator and to morph the system. So uh, on the, I guess, the right there, we have a system that draws out uh, the letter J, and we, we wish to morph it uh, towards uh, some specified point shown by the red star, and we see that uh, we can actually do that. Okay, so uh, something of interest is that a robot behavior can actually be defined in different task spaces. For example, uh, for, for a robot manipulator, we might want the end effector to uh, imitate some demonstrations, while the collision avoidance is defined on body points uh, on the robot. Uh, so what we can do here is actually use, uh, to pull back the infinitesimal generator, since we're uh, dealing with vector fields, um, using the pseudo inverse of the robot kinematics, into the, into the C space of the robot and then compose the diffeomorphic templates in the C space. So we run experiments in both simulation and on a real world six off Jacko arm. Um, so, in, so in these uh, simulated uh, examples here, um, we uh, show demonstrations to the robot of lifting a box, pushing a box and drawing the letter, uh, the character S. Um, and then we add additional obstacles and we're able to smoothly avoid them while carrying out uh, the motion. So some ex uh, experimental results and the overall take, uh, takeaway. So we compare against Euclidianizing flows um, from RANA 2020 with uh, additional uh, repulses for collision avoidance. We also compare against uh, MPNet, uh, which is a purely learning-based approach that learns to condition on the environment to generate trajectories. So uh, for for learning folks, it's, it's very tempting to see if we can actually just learn how to do collision avoidance by showing it enough trajectories and, condi and conditioning on the environment. But what we see is that even with a fairly large number of trajectories for an imitation learning setup, um, MPNet is unable to learn to avoid collisions. And relative to our Euclidianizing flows baseline, um, our, our diffeomorphic templates approach remains closer to the test trajectories while avoiding obstacles. So we have some experimental results on the real robot. Um, so uh, we show, again, how to, uh, the robot how to lift a box. And then we have this additional water bottle obstacle, and it's able to smoothly warp around and, and lift the box. Um, uh, likewise, with pushing a box, um, we show demonstrations, have this obstacle. Um, this is all fine, it's able to to push the box, drawing an S, um, and we add uh, this uh, cone obstacle. It's able to uh, avoid the obstacle and draw out the S. Uh, so placing uh, objects in different pots, so we show it demonstrations of dropping uh, an object into the center pot there, and then we uh, specify biases to drop it uh, to the left and to the right. Cool. So in conclusion, we introduce diffeomorphic templates to essentially uh, modularize all of these uh, different robot behavior um, for use in generalized imitation learning, so we can compose these diffeomorphic templates and uh, to construct a stable system from a known stable base system. 
So an avenue of future work uh, avenues of future work include developing more operations on these diffeomorphic templates. So for example, we can isolate new diffeomorphic templates uh, by looking at the difference between two sets of demonstrations. Additionally, uh, we aim to connect diffeomorphic templates with advances in the wider and booming uh, literature of continuous normalizing flows uh, from the machine learning community. Um, and that concludes uh, my presentation. Um, I welcome any questions. Any questions? Thanks so much for the interesting presentation. So for in the examples that you have shown, for example, when drawing IS, there was at some point a slowdown of speed. Does the deformorphism that you introduce introduce uh, uh, also change basically the speed of the trajectory or was this just a safety behavior? Yeah, 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 it, it, it does. Um, so yeah, it, it actually changes uh, the, the speed as well. Um, so we found it to somewhat occur, but it, it, it seems that if you directly add a repulsor, um, you, you could get that effect uh, even, like it slows down even more. But, um, but yeah, the, you can occasionally get these slowdowns as you're warping around um, a, a, an obstacle. More questions? Really cool experimental results. I'm curious, it seems like your approach, because it's imitation learning, it tries to follow some paths from experts. Yep. And if it identifies objects in the way, it'll just avoid those. Have you done any thinking about how to ensure that still trying to follow the path while avoiding obstacles still results in task completion? So in, in how to measure task completion? Right, like I wouldn't want to avoid an object and call it a success if my whole goal was to like fill a cup of water and I didn't do that. Right. Um, so, so, so I guess that's, that's almost in, in, in a kind of task planning um, setup. So, so we, we were kind of interested in just imitating these demonstrations and haven't thought about kind of uh, higher level tasks and, and kind of sequences of tasks. So that is definitely an avenue for future research. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, so this is all the time we had for cool. questions. So with that, we have the next speaker. Okay, next we're going to have uh, learning-based moving horizon estimation through differentiable convex optimization layers. All right, I hope the microphone is high enough. So thank you for joining my presentation on the work of learning-based moving horizon estimation, which was done in collaboration with Kim Babersich and Professor Melanie Zeilinger, and my name is Simon Mundwiller. So we've here heard this actually already quite a few times so far. Uh, the recent advancement in learning and also sensing technology promises to enable design of efficient control algorithms for large-scale systems in the area, for example, of manufacturing or power generation. Simultaneously, there are lots of research efforts in order to design safe learning-based control policies, which enable to prevent safety-critical failures of such systems. An issue which is, however, um, usually not considered is that we do, do not usually have full state measurements available in, in practice. So we tried to, to overcome this by looking into the design of advanced state estimation algorithms for systems subject to disturbances, measurement uncertainties, measurement noise, and also uncertain parameters in the system dynamics. And some challenges in, in these settings are that we usually 
would want to ensure stability of the resulting state estimation error, and we also want to adapt the estimator online to our unknown parameters in the system model. A method we consider promising to design such algorithms is moving horizon estimation, an optimization-based state estimator, which allows to consider nonlinear system models, um, and we can guarantee stability if we know the true system model and also under some assumption on the system model. Additionally, prior knowledge on disturbances or the states can be included in the optimization through constraints. Some of the rather open question with respect to our systems, our setting is that we usually require to know the, the true model of the system, and also there is the computational complexity of solving the estimation problem online. So in this work, we propose to formulate a moving horizon estimator as a differentiable optimization layer, which allows us to obtain the, de the gradient of our state estimate with respect to the parameters in the estimator, which we can use to online tune the estimator performance. The benefits of this approach is that the resulting online estimation problem remains convex and thus is easy to solve. Uh, additionally, we can adapt the estimator online to unknown system parameters and the implementation exists in efficient machine learning frameworks. So to the spe specific setting, sorry, we consider linear systems subject to unknown parameters in the system dynamics. We assume that the disturbances and measurement noise are distributed according to truncated Gaussians. And additionally, we assume there to be some prior knowledge on the states in the form of a constraint which is always satisfied. The goal now is to obtain a state estimate um, of our system state while simultaneously adapt the parameter within our estimator online in order to improve the estimator performance. Now, before going into this online tuning algorithm, let me summarize the moving horizon estimation framework we're using. So in moving horizon estimation, uh, we use a finite sequence of past measurements and we try to fit a sequence of state estimates in an optimization problem which represents those measurements in an optimal way. So in our online estimation problem, we minimize some objective on the estimated disturbances and measurement noise where the weighting of the cost comes from the covariances of our disturbance and measurement noise. Additionally, there is some prior weighting term which allows to mitigate the effect of neglected older measurements. And in the optimization, we constrain our system, our estimates to follow the system dynamics and the measurement model, while we can integrate prior knowledge through constraints. The resulting state estimate at the current time step is then just the last estimate in the obtained sequence of state estimates. A motivation for using this formulation of moving horizon estimation is that it, the solution is equivalent in a, to a standard Kalman filter. In the very simple case where we know the true parameters, we have a suitable prior weighting, and also we have no constraints, and uh, we use the true covariance matrices. So the issue with the formulation in our setting is that we require to know usually the true parameter in our system model. So an, an option in, in our case, where you don't know the parameter, would be to optimize simultaneously over state estimates and parameters. This, however, leads to a non-convex optimization problem because we have bilinearities in our system dynamics. So instead, we turn to an online tuning algorithm. Um, where the problem we want to solve is to minimize some, some output loss on the difference between our measurements and our nominal predicted measurements based on the state estimates with some regularization or using a disturbance estimate in order to prevent overfitting to our noisy measurements. Thereby, uh, we want to constrain that our state estimates are obtained by the MHE problem. Uh, which is an implicit mapping from our parameters to the state estimates. So therefore, we cannot solve this problem in one go, but we turn to an online iterative algorithm where we start by estimating the states based on, a, on some parameter value. Then, using those estimates, we construct a sampled output, regularized output loss, which we, in the next state, 
um, obtain the gradient of the loss with respect to our parameter in order to update the parameter in a gradient-based manner. Now, because we, uh, to obtain this gradient of the loss, as you can see in the loss function, we actually have our state estimates, which are the output of the MHG problem. So obtaining this gradient requires us to differentiate through our MHG problem. And in order to achieve this, we turn to the framework of differentiable convex optimization layers, which you should already know from yesterday's talk of Professor uh, Boyd. So just to recap it quickly, if you have a, a simple optimization problem with convex cost, convex equality, cons sorry, convex inequality constraints, and a fine equality constraint, we can directly form formulate this as a differentiable optimization layer, which allows us to obtain the, the gradient of the optimal solution of the problem with respect to the, its parameters. Now, the benefits of using this framework to form a moving horizon estimator is that simple implementations are available, and also we can potentially combine uh, this MHG layer with different layers, such as a neural network to pre-process sensor data, or a convex optimization control policy for which the framework was successfully applied already. So in order to formulate our moving horizon estimator as a convex optimization layer, we just have to add a few auxiliary variables in order to ensure that the grammar is satisfied. This in the end, allows us to differentiate our state estimate with respect to all the parameters in our MHE problem. And we are specifically interested in all the parameters which depend on our unknown parameter theta, which are the system dynamics and also the prior weighting. So after formulating our MHE as a differentiable optimization layer, we can go back to obtaining the gradient of our output loss, which we can now simply obtained through automatic differentiation along, along this graph for each cost term in our sampled objective. And as I already discussed before, so each in this cost term, we have the state estimates we are, which are depending on our system model and we thus need to differentiate through the MHE problem. So to, to summarize the overall Algorithm again, we start by estimating the state give, with some initial parameter. We sample an output loss. We obtain the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameter um, through automatic differentiation. And in the end, we can update the parameters using projected stochastic gradient descent, for example. We applied this on a numerical example of cooling a group of manufacturing systems where we know that the temperature of each um, manufacturing, sorry, we want to estimate the temperature in a group of manufacturing systems where the temperature of each system is constrained below some maximum temperature for safety reasons, but we do not know the coupling in between um, the machines. So on the right hand side, you see the, the learning plots over learning epochs of the evolution of our parameter theta where we can see that for both our MHE approach and also the standard common filter, in this case, the parameter converges quite nicely to the true underlying value. If you look at the validation loss, we can see that the validation loss of our MHE is much lower than the one of the Kalman filter. And the reason for this, you can see in this validation plot, where we show the temperatures and temperature estimates for one manufacturing machines with the true temperature being in black, as you can see, the Kalman filter estimates in red initially diverge from, from the, the true temperature for the wrong parameter. They track the temperature a bit better afterwards, but still they, they're not able to satisfy the constraint always. On the other side, our moving horizon estimation approach allows to always satisfy this upper temperature limit constraints on the estimates and tracks the true ground truth temperatures quite well in the end. So to summarize my presentation, we propose to formulate an MHG as a differentiable optimization layer, which allows us to optimize the performance of the estimator online in a gradient-based um, fashion. Uh, the resulting online estimation problem is a convex problem, and we can include prior knowledge through constraints. In future work, we are investigating the theoretical properties of 
adapting those parameters online in our estimator. And we also want to investigate how to combine this with advanced learning algorithms or learning-based controllers. Uh, the code of our implementation and also a numerical example is available on GitHub. And I want to thank you for your attention. Questions? Hi, uh, really interesting approach. So I was wondering if you faced an issue where uh, your moving horizon estimator, which is a QP in this case, I think, is not differentiable. Because you have strict inequality constraints in the QP, right? So I'm guessing it's not really always differentiable for all states. Yes, um, I guess here I have to refer to the talk of uh, Prof Professor Boyd yesterday. So I mean, I'm just using the, this framework and which, which handles all the differentiation for me. And I guess, so in the, in the framework, it's, it's kind of like what he said, like if it's not differentiable, then yeah, it just uses something. Or I, I don't know what exactly will happen at this point. Um, but yeah, that I didn't um, consider that. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? We have time for one more. So thank you for a very clear talk. So in the beginning, you mentioned that this MHE can also be used for nonlinear systems. So I was wondering if, for example, the theta is time varying because of linearization. Do you have any thoughts that uh, could you also be kind of modified to adapt to that? Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't understand the, the last part of the question. So you meant if the system model is nonlinear, then? Th then maybe say, for example, the theta are time varying instead of like constant. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't consider what, what's happening if, if the parameter is time varying, but that would be, I guess, very interesting to, to have a look at. But maybe I didn't get your question right, sorry. Okay. Okay, Thank great. Thank you. Uh, with that, we are ready for the next speaker. Thanks. All right. Next, we're going to have vision-based system identification and 3D key point discovery using dynamics constraints. A sensible height. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Michael Burke from Monash University uh, in Melbourne, and this is some work um, led by Miguel, who's just completed his PhD, which is why he looks like that. Um, <laughs> so, um, and I apologize for the lack of rigor in my talk, but I work from pixels, which means I get a get out of jail free card um, because there are no guarantees. Um, but in general, the problem statement that I'm trying to solve today. Um, is one of visual space, vision-based system identification. So the problem we have is I've got a video and maybe I know something about the, the dynamics that are present in that video. And what I'd like to find is maybe the trajectory of an object of interest moving in that video, the physical parameters governing the motion in that video, um, and also it would be nice if I found out where my camera was when that video was taken. Um, and, and this is useful for us um, to solve tasks like this. We're a robotics group, so we like to do fun things like this. Um, because if you think about solving this task, what we need is we need to know physical parameter estimation, so things like coefficient of restitution of that bouncing ball, where it is, so that we can predict where it's going to go in future. Um, we need to know where our camera is relative to the robot, so that we can actually move our, our robot arm to the right place. Um, and to, to train a perception module like that, is usually a lot of work. Um, and that requires supervised la labeling or, or some sort of labeling information to train that model. Um, so we'd be really good if we could do that without having to specify those labels. Um, and so the approach we proposed is really simple, goes back to basics, uh, works on a CPU. Um, and that was quite important to us because this has sort of come out of the end of quite a few pieces of work um, looking at doing end-to-end -end learning. Um, and an approach we've been trying to push is this idea of physics as inverse graphics, where what we'll do is we'll put a physics engine into a neural network and we'll try and 
do essentially annotized inference where we will train neural networks to predict the parameters of the physics engine and then try and use that to roll out future information um, and, and try and use that to sort of in, infer parameters of interest, so train key point detectors or, or object trackers for free. And this works, it's really exciting, um, but only on really toy problems. This doesn't scale to real world problems yet. Um, and it also requires a lot of graduate student descent, um, which is something we wanted to avoid. And so we, we channeled our inner Stephen Boyd and came up with a very simple three-stage approach that goes back to classical techniques um, and does pretty well. So the first step is we extract some key point tracks from our images. Um, the second step is we optimize and try and solve for the initial conditions of the dynamics model, um, maybe the, the parameters of interest in that, uh, that dynamics model that roll out, um, and try and find out where our camera is. And we do that in a two-stage optimization process. And then finally, we just select the best tra trajectory. Um, and, and that, in this case, is one that maximizes the likelihood, along with sort of an entropy criterion to make sure we, we are robust to sort of distract our objects. Um, so I guess to go into that a bit more detail, we considered a couple of different environments to test this on. One is simulated bouncing balls where we can generate lots of data, um, different sort of physical parameters. The other one I needed to calibrate to camera. Um, so we programmed our robot to move in a very specific motion and tried to find out where the camera was relative to that. Um, and so for our first stage, what we, we do is trajectory proposal, and we played around with lots of modern key point detectors and, and neural network approaches, but what we found worked best of all is if we just put a grid of key points on the image, tracked everything using a very old fashioned key point tracker. So Lucas Canada key point tracker. Um, so we have these as trajectory proposals. Um, and then we just feed those into an optimization process where we say, let me try and minimize the distance between those observed tracks that we had and ones rolled out according to our dynamics model. Um, and so in this case, we're, we're trying to find out where was the camera that we could observe these projected key points, but also then what were the parameters of interest that generated a particular trajectory. And we tried out a few different optimization approaches. Um, and one that seems to work the best here is an expectation maximization approach. And I think that's just because of the particularities of camera. It's very non-linear sort of motion, and there are quite a few symmetries in that, that that mean that it's quite easy to get stuck. So sort of separating these two and alternating between them seems to work quite well. Um, what we also found that was quite important was this idea of instead of doing a optimization across the entire trajectory, we slowly increment and move along them. Um, so I, I suspect this actually means that something like a sequential Monte Carlo approach might be good for inference in this case, um, but it, it turns out it's very hard to get this sort of optimization to converge if you consider the entire trajectory. And I think that that's also because it's really important to try and get a, a good idea of where your camera is before you can start to roll out. Um, so once we have that, we've now got a series of possible candidate dynamics models and, and tracks, which is say, let's just pick the best one. So I pick the one with the highest entropy. Um, and that allows us to ignore distract emotions. So for example, this motion over here, um, a bouncing ball, you could probably find a system of equations that generated that, that motion. Um, but it's not likely for the class of problems we're looking at, probably the object or the motion dominating the scene is the one of interest. And so that's why the, it's a useful heuristic to pick this out. Um, and, and this works quite well. It's, it's pretty robust to moving distractors. So if we look at some results, you don't see that much performance degradation in terms of being able to infer the parameters um, when you have sort of moving distracting objects that maybe don't follow the equations of motion that, that you're particularly looking for. Um, you can see here that the camera angle error that we have here is quite large. Um, and I think that this speaks to a problem of persistent excitation in your data. You do need your sort of the motion to be informative to infer that. And maybe we'll say a bit more about that, but I think there needs to be some work around this. Um, so the nice thing is once you've found the track of interest, we now have a supervised learning problem. So instead of this, this previous case where we are attempting to learn everything end to end, learn to predict the, the parameters of our model jointly with, with doing this inference. Here we we've now, by breaking it up into stages, we have a very simple 
supervised learning problem. And so essentially we have a way of going from video to an object tracker, which say for example could track the end effect of our robot or, or track the bouncing ball so that we can now intercept it with our robot. Um, as sort of a, a bonus, we tried out a different um, trajectory or a selection criteria where rather than picking the best key point track, we said, well, can we find a region of interest? And so this is a, a nice example where the dynamics we were looking for was that of breathing. And so we said, well, we're just looking for sinusoidal motion in, in the image. Give me pixels that, that follow sinusoidal motion. Um, and so the parameter we're trying to infer here is the breathing rate. Um, and what we're trying to find is say, give me the regions or the pixels in, in the scene that exhibit breathing. Um, and you can see these sort of green pixels over here seem to lock on to torsos. We struggle a bit, and this is where our key point detector is failing um, on, on certain types of scenes. Um, but overall, it worked quite nicely. So I guess to conclude, this is a very simple three-stage method for dynamics constrained key point discovery and system identification. Um, and I guess sort of what for me has been a bit of a theme of the conference is this idea that knowledge of the dynamics that you're expecting to see in, in your system or the equations of motion or, or any kind of physical structure you have can be used to, to help constrain that learning. And I think we, we've been looking at this, uh, sort of trying to do this all in an end-to-end -end fashion, but actually just breaking it down into a few different stages can actually dramatically simplify that process. Um, and for us, from a vision perspective, is what's interesting is that this, those dynamics can actually give you interesting things like camera calibration or almost free labeling to train perception modules. Um, as I said, not much rigor here um, and, and sort of open questions around what that persistent excitation criterion needs to be. What, what, what do you need to see in, in the video for you to actually be able to infer, infer all the perimeter um, things? And then this works well for key point representations, um, but it's likely that we will have to go back to the more complicated neural network models for things like deformable objects or, or fluid body dynamics. Um, so although I think this three-stage process is really nice, probably for more complicated problems, we, ne we need to bring back that learning phase. Um, thank you. Questions? Hi, I'm curious how, I understand the three-stage method and that seems to make a lot of sense. If you wanted to implement this in real time, so say you know the class of dynamical system that you're expecting to see, but you don't know the parameters, have you thought about how you might use those three stages in maybe an iterative way to try and learn those parameters online? And what kind of performance would you expect? So I think this is essentially just changing the, so we've thought of this in, in a global optimization sense. Um, and, and I think doing this in an online fashion basically turns it into a, a sequential inference problem. So something like a particle filter would actually work really well here, uh, I think, it, and, th and that could cope with that online process. Um, so I don't think, this, this is classical techniques that, that are working really well here. Um, so I think extending to that online fashion would take that. I'm not sure I'd call it learning so much as just inferring online. Um, I think the caveat there is that you probably need to have a really good initial conditions, um, or at least a, a good estimate of where you're starting um, to continue to track over time. But yeah, useful. Oh. Thank you. Extension, yeah. Thank you. We have time for one more question. All right, okay, thank you again. All right, and our last talk in the session is going to be on tracking and planning with spatial world models.
Okay, now, now I'm running into the issue of finding my cursor. Oh, over there. Okay. Yeah, it's always a challenge with mirroring versus expanding. Anyway. Uh, okay, uh, I'm Parish, and I'll be talking about our paper, Tracking and Planning with Spatial World Models. So this is a cartoon sketch of how modern approaches to navigation work. You have your SLAM backend, which is responsible for mapping the environment and, sorry. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so you have your SLAM backend, which is responsible for uh, mapping the environment and tracking the pose of the agent. And it communicates with a high level planner uh, which is supposed to plan a trajectory that reaches a goal, and then you have your low-level controller which tries to track that plan. And this is a very powerful approach, but it is also very specific to navigation, and it is kind of different to how control problems are usually solved. If you look at mole-based control, uh, we generally have these three components. You have your emission model, your transition model, and your uh, cost model, um, and these have some parameters theta. The uh, emission and transition models inform a state estimator that is trying to approximate the posterior or the agent state given, given uh, observations. And then you have a planner which is informed by a transition model and uh, the cost model. So you can plan ahead using your transition model and you can um, try to find the best controls by minimizing the cost. And what we try to do in this paper is to uh, bridge the gap between uh, a modern approach to navigation and, and how model-based control works. And what we have done is we've basically replaced the uh, SLAM backend with uh, what we call a spatial world model, um, kind of just a buzzword for um, meaning that we have an emission model and a, and a transition model and then we have a state estimator that is informed by these models. So the emission model is uh, based on um, recent approaches to differentiable rendering. Um, for the transition model, we assume that we have some uh, prior knowledge about the dynamics. And then uh, for state estimation, we will be using uh, the dynamics and uh, a method for image alignment. The uh, parameters of our emission model are two voxel grids. So you have one voxel grid for uh, color and another for uh, occupancy. If you have a point in 3D space, you can read from these voxel grids using interpolation, which gives you these two functions, G and F. So G would give you the color of a point, F would give you uh, whether that point is occupied or not. And then using these two functions, you can build a uh, rendering algorithm that is differentiable. And the way that works is that you build the image pixel by pixel. For each pixel, you send out a ray into the world. And then you have to find out where that ray intersects uh, the world. And uh, you can do that by discretizing the ray with a finite number of points. And then you find the first point uh, that is occupied according to the occup occupancy function. And then uh, you basically know that the exact hit point happened uh, somewhere between this point and the point before it. And what we do is we linearize the function in this region, and uh, that allows us to find the exact intersection point. And once we have that point, we can just uh, read its color from the color map, and that gives us the RGBD value of one pixel. Uh, our generative model factorizes over pixels, so uh, the likelihood of an image would be just a product of the likelihoods of uh, every pixel, and given a uh, data set of RGBD images, you can learn the parameters of the map using gradient descent. This is how the uh, emission model works. Now let's look at how the state estimation part works. So this part is basically trying to approximate the posterior over the agent state, given a stream of observations. Um, the first objective you see here would basically be a maximum a posteriori objective where you have your um, likelihood term, that is the log p of x, and then you have your prior term, which is given by the uh, dynamics, which is this log p of uh, zt. 
And the way previous approaches have um, solved this problem um, in the realm of differentiable rendering is, is to uh, do gradient descent on this objective. The problem with that is that uh, the likelihood term is quite expensive because that requires you to render an image, which is an expensive operation. The way people have dealt with that is to subsample the image using a small number of pixels. Uh, we take a slightly different approach where we replace this likelihood with a proxy objective, which is this big term at the bottom. Let's look at what happens uh, here. So basically, you have your current observation, your current camera image. This is the one on the right here. And then you uh, render a reference image from your model, which is uh, the image on the left here. And then you keep these images frozen, and you try to align them by uh, projecting points from the current observation into your uh, reference image. And you basically try to, uh, you try to uh, align the RGBD values. This is not something that we came up with. This is just called point-to-plane ICP with photometric constraints. But uh, it uh, wasn't really used in a differentiable rendering uh, context yet, and, and we have added the uh, prior term. And, and why is this good? The benefit of this is that you only have to render from your model once per every time you try to optimize uh, f to find the current pose. So if you want to do 100 gradient updates, you just need to render an image once uh, for that time. Um, this is as accurate as doing gradient descent on the uh, true likelihood, but it is much faster. So the, the two curves that you see here are empirical cumulative distribution functions of the uh, location error and orientation error for using the uh, true likelihood term versus our proxy term. And you can see that the curves are basically identical, which means that the two methods make errors in the same way. Uh, but one happens to be much faster than the other. So on the right, you see a runtime breakdown of, of these methods. The uh, brown bar in the center is how long it takes to evaluate the likelihood term, the, the true likelihood term, uh, which is at 0 0.25 seconds, even with um, image subsampling. So you can only do about four frames per second with this. And then the bar immediately to the um, immediately after that one is is our proxy term, which is um, uh, running at about 0 0.06 seconds. So you could do um, more than 16 frames per second with this. Uh, the planning part, as I hinted earlier, th this is pretty classical. There's not much new happening here. We just use a star search, given the uh, learned uh, occupancy map. And we have a simple low-level controller that uh, tracks uh, a -star, the plans generated by A-star search. Um, the dynamics we are assuming here is, uh, are very simple. You have a robot that can um, go backward or forward along its current heading, and it can turn left and right by a small amount. Uh, we evaluate this pipeline in uh, six uh, realistic floor plans, which we have converted into levels for the VisDoom simulator. So the VisDoom simulator is a simulator based on the Doom video game. Uh, on the image here, you see an uh, uh, observation from that. So it is pretty cartoonish and unrealistic, but the, um, uh, it, al it allowed us to use these complex um, uh, floor plans. Uh, we also add noise to the uh, dynamics to make the problem harder. You see this effect on the uh, bottom right image. The uh, thick blue line is an optimal plan that uh, starts somewhere and reaches another location. And the uh, red circles are basically where you end up if you try to execute this plan under the uh, noise distribution. So you end up in a lot of different, in a you know, wide variety of different places. Um, okay. And uh, we experimented with three different levels of noise, and we compared our method to two baselines. The first is uh, trying to use this 
proxy objective plus the dynamics without using a map. Uh, in this case, the reference image that you use would always be the previous camera image. So you basically just have a visual odometry uh, model. And then the second is just using the dynamics model. And it, uh, yeah, our, yeah. This is the classic thing of our method uh, works better than the others, I guess, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, we've also tried some uh, more visually realistic uh, scenes from the AI through Thor uh, data set. This is basically a data set of um, uh, sort of handcrafted living spaces like living rooms. Um, these three images you see are, are learned uh, models so you can see that they, they can capture the complexity of a realistic scene pretty well. And we can also track and navigate in these scenes, but uh, the problem here is that these are just like living rooms, so it, it doesn't really make much sense to try to evaluate navigation here. Um, so some feature work for us is to evaluate this stuff um, in, a, in a setting that is both um, large scale and uh, visually realistic. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, you can ask them now or come by the poster later. Any question? Hi, I had a question on the noise. Um, you had that figure with the blue pathways and the red dots? Yeah. So I was wondering, is that noise that's added to your system, or is that kind of a more of a what happens when a kind of a dynamics model mismatch happens? Oh, that's, that's noise added to the uh, system. So basically, whenever the agent tries to turn left, it ends up turning by a random amount. Mm -hmm. so, so the agent says, I want to turn left by 3 degrees, and it might turn 0 0.5 degrees or 7 degrees or 5 degrees. So that's, that's the type of, it's, it's clipped Gaussian noise uh, too, yeah. Yeah, so the red dots, they seem pretty spread out. Is it all trying to achieve the same policy as that blue line? Um, yeah, I should say this is, uh, this is an open loop execution. So it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't try to correct itself. Mm -hmm. This is just to illustrate like over time, if you don't replan and if you don't like re-estimate, your state, what would happen uh, due to noise, okay. basically, Thank yeah. Thank you, we have time for one more question. Okay, maybe I have a... Hi, thanks for the great talk. I'm curious about extensibility of your voxel grid. Is it open-ended? Can you add points in your voxel grid? Or have you thought about that? Uh, no, we can't. We, we have thought about that, but it's, it's basically at the level of um, just having discussions over coffee. It's, it's like, uh, fundamentally, our voxel grid spans a certain s area in space, and that's fixed. There's a fixed coordinate range that we can span. And we have uh, been thinking about how, how we would implement it so that you could extend it, uh, or how you could make it more efficient, uh, because voxel grids just waste a lot of parameters to empty space. And we've been trying things like uh, voxel hashing, uh, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's just one of the many things that uh, are in our backlog, basically. Yeah. Thanks. Great. With that, thank you again for your great talk. Thank you to all the speakers of this session.